Hello and welcome to Inside Iraq. I'm Jasim Azawi. Muqtada Sadr has gone back to school to become an ayatollah. Is he positioning himself for a new battle against his bitter enemy, Al-Hakim? A struggle for power, money, and control of religious shrine is underway between the two households. So how will it end? And will U.S. forces help Al-Hakim to eliminate the firebrand cleric? A tenuous peace is barely separating the armies of the two camps. So will the current ceasefire hold? Or is a spark liable to ignite the entire South for a new round of winner-takes-all? Rawi Aragah reports. These scenes mark what was probably the most savage fighting between the two main Shia militias in Iraq. The clashes last August in the holy city of Karbala during a major religious festival left more than 50 people dead and up to 300 injured. Three days later, Muqtad al-Sadr called for his militia, known as the Mahdi army, to put down its arms. One month later, he signed a pact of honor with his rival Shia leader, Abdul Aziz al-Hakim. All along, it's been a turf war between Sadr's Mahdi army and al-Hakim's supreme Iraqi Islamic Council with its military wing, the Badr Brigade. But how serious was their reconciliatory move? This pact was more of an ethical statement, a list of principles rather than a detailed political document. In 2007, after separating Sunni and Shia neighborhoods, the real divisions within each sect began to appear, and that's why we're seeing this divide between al-Sadr and al-Hakim blocs. The pact's not expected to last because it does not deal with the real issues prompting this divide, including a fight over leadership, resources and tribal compositions. The two parties have been jockeying for control of Iraq and its majority Shia population since the fall of Saddam Hussein. And the fight's been perhaps most visible here, on the streets of the southern cities of Basra, Najaf and Karbala, where posters of the two men and their slain fathers adorn the streets. And whoever controls these streets and their holy shrines may also end up in control of the revenues of this oil-rich region. It's a high-stakes power play. We're talking about two very different agendas here. Al-Sadr has a very clear stance against the American presence in Iraq and other issues. Meanwhile, Al-Hakim's bloc has supported and cooperated with the Americans. It's also a staunch supporter of federalism. This clash in ideologies was reflected on the ground and politically. On the political front, Hakim's party has 30 seats in Iraq's 275-member parliament. Sadr's bloc has slightly more at 32. But Sadr's six ministers have boycotted the government since April. And in mid-September, the fiery cleric also pulled out his MPs, protesting the performance of Nur al-Maliki's government. Today, Sadr's followers face arrest as security forces, mainly loyal to his rivals, continue to pose a threat. The tensions are high despite the truce and how this rivalry will play out is likely to have a key role in shaping Iraq's future, especially in light of the declining Sunni Shia violence. Rawi Ragah for Inside Iraq. To understand why Muqtada wants to burnish his religious credentials and become an ayatollah, and whether cooperation or confrontation will be the next cycle between the al-Sadr and al-Hakim, I'm joined from Beirut by Mohammed Bizzi, a visiting fellow from the Council on Foreign Relations. Mr. Bizzi, thank you for joining us. What lies really behind Muqtada Sadr to go back to school? Is he positioning himself for a new round of confrontation with Hakim? Is this a cynical move to re exploit religion? I would say it's a pragmatic political move um, to burnish his re religious credentials, as you said and also to prepare for a new round of confrontation with al-Hakim and, and his political party. Um, I think Sutter might also be concerned that at some point al-Hakim will reach the status of Ayatollah. And if he does that before a Sutter does, then al-Hakim and his entire movement might be able to generate more religious credentials and might be able to draw some more support in southern Iraq. We should also keep in mind that this happened right around the same time as uh, British forces gave control of Basra to, uh, to the Iraqi government. Um, this is when the news came out about uh, Sutter uh, trying to go back to resume his studies to be an Ayatollah. 
this desire, this quest for respect as well as religious legitimacy, it has a massive political consequences for a Sadr's movement as well as for the entire South, doesn't it? Indeed it does. Um, you have in, in southern Iraq is home to something like 70 percent of Iraq's oil and uh, really whoever becomes dominant in Basra is going to control the rest of southern Iraq and naturally you're going to have Sadr and Hakim uh, competing for influence in the south and one major way to gain influence is to prove your re religious legitimacy. Both of them come from a long line of clerics. Both of them have family legitimacy. Both of them have many martyrs in their families. And, and they're really on equal footing in, in that way, in, in the department of you know, who comes from the right lineage. They both come from the right lineage. And, and now it's a competition to, to see who's going to uh, garner these religious credentials first. More importantly, above and beyond the lineage and uh, the religious mantles they are wearing, they are bitter enemies, not only recently after the invasion, but the Al-Hakim household and the Sadr household for many, many years, they were on the opposite side of the political and religious spectrum, weren't they? They were for, for many years of the competition between the two. Obviously, since the U.S. invasion, that the nature of that competition has changed. Uh, there's more. Each one has militias on the ground in Iraq. There were periods when the several members of the two families worked together. We should remember uh, uh, Ayatollah Muhammad uh, Bakir al-Hakim worked with Ayatollah uh, Bakir al-Sadr at, uh, at one point in the late 70s. There was some relationship of working together, but there was also this, this competition for dominance and, and really different, they come from different schools of thought. Let's go to Muqtada Sadr. He is wearing his father's mantle. Uh, his pretty much prestige rests on the Al Sadr family. He's young, he's only 33, and his title right now is Hujjat al Islam. And even that is questionable. We don't know really whether he has become Hujjat al Islam or not. But can he ever become as big as his father? It's very unlikely that he could reach the status and the popular stature of his father. Uh, he hasn't shown the tendency uh, of religious scholarship, that sort of deep, deep scholarship and deep study that his father had. He hasn't shown the output in terms of uh, writing and, and research and the statements that his father had. He also lacks just the, the personal charisma of his father, which is very important in a, in a re religious leader at that level. Um, so on all those levels, he's not going to be like his father. But he's shown some political sensibility, and, and more political sensibility than the Americans and other Iraqi factions have given him credit for. And this move to try to become an Ayatollah at this stage is really just another example of his acute political sense and, and how he understands the importance of imagery and, and the use of his family's history and, and, and religious symbolism to improve his credentials on the street. You are saying that he is a better politician than a militia leader. He tried his luck with the Americans twice in 2004, and he got a tremendous drubbing. Has he gotten the lesson? I, I would hope so. Uh, if, if he did not learn that lesson, and if there's another confrontation with the Americans, it's going to be very bloody again, and his militia and his supporters m might suffer tremendous losses. Uh, he might have better luck in a, in a military confrontation with al-Hakim's forces. There are a lot of moves right now to, for this peace treaty between the two of them to extend it into next year. Uh, you know, there, there, there's a move to prevent this intra-Shia fighting, but he has shown more political skills than militia skills. I mean, his, his skills at participating in the parliamentary elections at the end of 2005, uh, the skill that he and his supporters showed in helping elect Prime Minister Maliki and in becoming one of his important bases of support, Prime Minister Maliki really owes Sadr for, for his election. And, and that just showed tremendous political skill. Let us examine his luck and his possibility of uh, 
whether he will end up on top against Al Hakim forces. Right now, most of the Iraqi army, most of the police force, even the intelligence in the south at least has been infiltrated, if not controlled totally by Al Hakim. While Jaysh al Mahdi is a ragtag militia, true, every now and again is supported by Iran, but Al Hakim forces are supported by the US and Iran. So, what chances Muqtada Sadr has against Al Hakim? It's true that Sadr and his militia are at this strategic disadvantage against Al Hakim. As you said, Al Hakim's forces are well entrenched inside the security forces. In Basra, they have an important presence in other cities in, in the south. Um, and, and they have the support of both the US and Iran, whereas Sadr occasionally has the support of Iran. Um, but it's, it's important not to discount Sutter right away, because he, he has some skill at building support and uh, playing this game of political patronage, where if, if he's able to get certain ministries you know, of, of handing out jobs and favors and, and playing the same game that Hakim played to use the government resources yes. that he's able to get, to use them for, to help to get people to support him. Mr. Bezzi, last question. Uh, he's been frowned upon by the elderly cl clerics. Perhaps even they disdain him for mixing politics with religion. Can Muqtada Sadr be rehabilitated and even being accepted by the Americans? It's difficult to imagine a scenario where the Americans will accept him after everything that happened. But I can see a scenario where the Americans will tolerate his presence and not look for another confrontation with him. Uh, because he does have popular support. He's working towards this new religious legitimacy. And it's really not in the U.S. interest to start a, a huge new battle with him. I mean, the U.S. wants to try its best right now to show that Iraq is stable. And as long as Sutter tries to keep his fighters under control and not to challenge U.S. forces, I don't see the, any advantage to the U.S. Uh, going after him um, and starting a whole new battle. Visiting fellow from the Council on Foreign Relations, Mohammed Bizzi, thank you for being a guest on Inside Iraq. Thank you for having me. We'll take a short break. We'll come back. Stay with us. Muqtada is young, that's true. But he has the right to lead the Shia of Iraq. And he never left Iraq like those other clerics who went to London while Saddam massacred the Shia, Mahdi army fighter. 